Joining us now with reaction, the author of the best selling book, Treason, former Speaker of the House, Fox News contributor, New Kingrich. This guy fascinated me. I sent you a note about him last night. What he did is he would fly over the Golden Triangle. They lost all these jobs, they didn't have labor issues. He saw all this opportunity. He literally forced the local government to invest in roads, sewers, and even a huge electrical bid. And he was able to bring, for example, a helicopter plant there, a tire plant there, uh, a steel producing plant there. They put a special electric grid in just to entice them to come. Now, if we're going to spend up to a trillion dollars on infrastructure, I want him spending it, not those 535 clowns in D.C. Am I wrong? No, I, I think you're me. onto a big thing. And, uh... No, I'm not. I, I think you're onto something that's very, very big. Uh, and I happened this afternoon to be talking to Dr. Ben Carson, uh, who sees the same vision for the inner city of public-private partnerships, of breaking out of the bureaucracy, of getting people who are successful job creators to come in and work to actually develop areas where people have jobs, where there are factories, where there's employment, and where there are schools that succeed. So I, th I think the Trump administration is going to be very aggressive about reaching beyond the traditional bureaucracy. And, you know, I have a very simple rule, which is to take the, the Woolman skating rink model, which is it took Trump uh, $3 million in two and a half months to do what the city of New York failed to do with $13 million in six years. So take that formula. If you want a trillion dollars in effect under a Donald Trump, you might get that for $350 billion because he's going to spend it so much more aggressively in such a much tough-minded, let's get it done, let's be frugal, let's be practical. This is a guy who builds buildings. He doesn't just give speeches, and I think he's going to lead us to real job creation. You know, I loved his idea from the beginning about allowing multinational corporations that park trillions of dollars overseas, repatriate that money, bring it back to America, 10% flat tax, one-time tax, bring it back. What if he said, I'll make it a 5% tax, but you've got to invest X million dollars in, in factories, manufacturing centers, job creation in Detroit, Milwaukee, Baltimore, Cleveland, and Philadelphia, and other cities that need it. Good idea? I think, well, it's exactly what Jack Kemp was advocating years ago in creating enterprise zones, areas where you, you dramatically limit the regulations, you make it fast and easy to start a job, you give a good tax advantage, you have a school that actually teaches people how to work, teaches them the skills they need for a job. You put that package together right, you can have very dramatic economic growth. What do you, what do you think of the idea of going forward that... You call it Trumpism. Let me ask you this. You're about to give a speech to the Heritage Foundation, and I don't want you to give your whole speech away, but you define part of Trumpism. If you see something really stupid, change it. What is Trumpism? What are you right. defining as Trumpism? Well, well, first of all, I'm trying to learn from Trump by watching what he does. And this goes all the way back to his book, The Art of the Deal, which is where I first got the woman skating rink story. It comes from Rudy Giuliani telling me about uh, the Ferry Point Park in Bronx, where Trump got a golf course built in 18 months, where neither Giuliani nor Bloomberg could get it done. So I'm looking at what is it this guy does? How does he think? What's he trying to do? And this, this trip to Indiana, the carrier uh, example is perfectly Trump-like. He sees a problem. He thinks there's an opportunity. He picks up the phone. He gets the job done. And now he moves on to the next topic. But, and but you're going to see him saying? over and over do that. So, uh, you got uh, some even conservatives. Oh, that's economic fascism. Why? But every, well, all are, 50 governors are. in the country. I used to have often Governor Perry, Governor Abbott, Governor Scott, Governor Jindal. You know why they kept coming to my New York studio? Because they were trying to entice businesses from New York and New Jersey to invest in their huh. states. And guess what? They did. And it worked. Well, let me, let me say two things about this. Trump is the first American president to realize that we're in a worldwide economic competition, just like the 50 states are in a competition. I mean, these guys who yell free trade, have they, have they ever tried doing business in Mexico? Have they tried doing business in China? Uh, what are they talking about? 
Uh, you, 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 this, this is an interesting theoretical model, and I've read Adam Smith. I, I'm happy to debate the wealth of nations any time, because he actually has very clear places where he says it doesn't work. Uh, and even Smith thought you had to modify it. But I think these guys who are sitting around these academic centers spouting off ideology are as much out of touch with reality as left-wingers who are sitting around similar centers spouting off their version of ideology. Trump is, in the classic American sense, a pragmatist. Uh, William James once said that pragmatism was the one unique American contribution to philosophy. And what it means is you look at the facts and the facts tell you how to act. You don't have some grand theory which tells you what the facts ought to be. Now here in the couch, Laura Ingram. Oh, that's Where, so funny. How do you love... Okay, so <laughs> here he yeah, is. that funny. Yeah. <laughs> He's suggesting low energy. Ben Carson is... That's hilarious. But the Democrats are writing these jokes over there. That's the my people question. people that do SNL. Oh, my gosh. They got to they up the ante. The Democrats, though, are aflame that Ben Carson is not qualified to run the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. But at the same time, I've gotten a million email from friends who said... Exactly what was Barack Obama qualified to run when he became president? Yeah, yeah he was showered with the most glowing media coverage. We did the burger runs with Brian Williams. Now the president-elect president -elect is going for a burger run. Or, you know, <laughs> so, look, we, we, I think most Americans know that there is not going to be really uh, usually a, an objective attempt to cover at least this period of the, of the Trump transition. And, and I think uh, we're going to see more of that same type of coverage going forward. You know, forward. are we just going through the Eyes roster? wide open. Right. Yeah. Uh, today, the roster of people going into, is going to, for the viewers, of, uh, to meet at Trump Tower is going to be Iowa Governor Terry Branstad, mm -hmm. South Carolina Representative Mike Mulvaney, and uh, Laura Ingram. Do you know anything oh, about those three? Wait a second. Um, uh, Laura Ingram's going to be at Trump Tower first today? First of all, where did you get that list? Where did that come <laughs> from? <laughs> That's out. Uh, well, you know, I've known Donald Trump for a long time, and we've been friends for a long time, and I'm looking forward to having the conversation. I, there's no agenda. There's, there really is no agenda. Uh, I think, obviously, my name has been bandied about for uh, press secretary. And it's a great privilege to, to even be considered. Uh, it sounds kind of sappy, but I really mean that. There are a lot of considerations uh, and a lot, of, a lot of qualified people out there. Mm -hmm. But I, t I tangle with these issues every day, and as you do, Brian, three hours a day. I've been doing my radio show for 15 years. And I kind of broke the glass ceiling in political talk radio for, for women. And uh, it, you know, it's, it's been a great, I've had a great, well, great ride in radio. Way. And, and, and Would it be a tough that's... decision for you? Well, you know, I think every, every new stage in your, in your life, if this ends up being a, a new stage in life, you have to think about everything, your family, your children. Sure. Um, I'm a single mom of three uh, kids, 11, 8, and 6. God bless you. And uh, they're my light. They're my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of considerations. But, you know, there, I talked to someone over the weekend who uh, you all would know. And I said, well, you know, if, if this opportunity presented itself, and he said, sometimes it's really good to... to change up your life a little bit. Give it a little mm. jolt. Give it a, little, a couple paddles on the side and like change things up a little bit. Um, and sometimes if, you're, if your country calls you and right. if God opens that door, you have to really seriously consider it. And, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, sure. and God does. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I prayed about a lot over the last uh, couple of years, especially with our country. And if I can really help, then, you know, it's hard to say no to that if I can yeah. be a great help, which well, I think I could. The guy who's got the job right now, Josh Ernest, yesterday was asked by the assembled press corps at the White House, yeah. hey, what do you make of uh, Donald Trump picking up the phone, taking the congratula uh, congratulatory call from the president yeah. of Taiwan? And he essentially said, yeah, we don't know what he's doing, but we fixed it. We've made it clear to China. There's just one China, big China, not the little one. The Taiwan Relations Act, uh, which has been reaffirmed in Congress, uh, you know, now for decades, requires us to be a strong and powerful ally of Taiwan. They're a democratic country. We could potentially, you know, have to defend them militarily. Sure. And there's bipartisan support for that on Capitol Hill, always has been. So the idea that Donald Trump cannot take a call without checking in with Beijing or Josh Ernest or is preposterous. I think, I think we're seeing a, a change, clearly, and it's a reorientation of America's place in the world. And I think, frankly, people should be happy that we have a president, president-elect, who's going to say, look, we're looking out for our interests first and that of our allies. We're it's not like going to be on our heels because mm -hmm. China's upset about something. We're also not going to be overly aggressive or, or throw ourselves into some military conflict without true consideration. You could take this job tomorrow 
and be able to do it because you know the issue so well. Anyone who hears you on this couch, watches you in the, a remote, sees you do a show, listens to your radio show, knows that. When you look at others that have done it, who do you look at and say, man, that's the way to do it? Is uh, Well, there's so many, people have different strengths, and I think at different points in our history, most people in that job have complimented the position uh, well. I mean, uh, Dana Prano sent me some great emails giving me some advice. Uh, Tony Snow was an old friend of mine. We, we knew each other since I was at the Reagan White House. One of my first lunches I ever had as a domestic policy aide in the Reagan administration was with Tony Snow, and he was an editorial writer at the Washington Times. And then to see him through his career, his grace, his, his poise, uh, and come, stepping in at that job at the White House. At the, uh, the worst time. The worst time. And he's really remains an inspiration to me. And he was a great father, a, a great family mm -hmm. man. And so Tony is, you know, he remains a light. I think about him a lot. So I think Tony also, uh, you know, I think Mike McCurry did a great job, you know, in a very difficult time. Uh, for his boss, uh, and he's, he's someone who's an old friend of mine as well. So both of those, and I don't want to mean, leave anyone out, but th th those two are just, I've known for a long time, and uh, I look at them. Hey, Laura, there's this atheist group. We had uh, one of the representatives on at the beginning of the yeah. show, and our, um, our viewers have written written uh -oh. in all morning long. His name is Nick Fesh, and he was on our show talking about how these they're putting up these billboards, these signs. Oh, that again? This is what they look like. They do that all Instead of saying, year. make America great again, they're saying, make, make Christmas great again, skip church. Here he is from earlier on our show, and we'll get your reaction. What we're doing is reaching out to people uh, in these communities who feel pressure to go to church, who maybe don't believe uh, in the religious component of things. Uh, we want people to know in these communities who feel alone that they're not. I don't spend all my time, you know, telling Christians not to go to church. I tell, I want to tell people who are no longer Christians, people who don't believe anymore, right. that they don't need to keep going to church. It's okay to be an atheist. It doesn't make you a bad person. Uh, you know, I give to charity. I sure. work at soup kitchens. I do all those things yeah. because I want to help people, not because I'm being promised heaven or threatened right. hell. So every year, the atheists buy billboards yeah. to get this conversation started. It started today. Uh, like Christmas caroling and, and the, uh, you know, watching the Rockettes. This is the <laughs> annual tradition yeah. of the atheists. You know, I, and I watch uh, folks like that. I actually feel bad for them. I, I mean, I really do. I used to get kind of upset about it. But it, there's no one more dogmatic at Christmas time than an atheist who claims to be worried about being pressured from going to church. I think there are a lot of churches across the country uh, that want more people in the pews, frankly. I don't think we have to worry about right. too many people being pressured to go to church. But more than, more than anything, I think they're trying to get attention, and I, I tend to just... It's, it's the spirit of the, of the season. It's so powerful. Yeah. I love Christmas. I yeah. love the lead up to Christmas, and I want everyone to be reminded that the 12 days of Christmas start on Christmas and go all the way to the Epiphany, mm -hmm. then Carnival season in New Orleans, all the way to Lent <laughs> when it gets really tough. But this is like the this is the Christmas season, and people have to, I think, just be filled with joy. The, the atheists want to push non-belief on people, much more so than I think most Christians that I, I know are awesome. trying to push their belief. It's dogmatic. But there's it's something awesome. weird about telling people to stay home. If you're staying yeah. home, it usually means you forgot to do something. Exactly. Oh, I forgot. I'm being productive. Exactly. Well, I, again, I think that most Americans today feel, uh, feel very, very hopeful at Christmas time. I know some people are upset about Trump, and I get that. We, a lot of people were upset in 2008 mm -hmm. when Barack Obama won. But this, this time of year, on Christmas Eve, when everything stops and there really is a hush, isn't that nice? And, and I was talking, I was at a 35th high school reunion over the weekend, which is hilarious. And we were all talking in Glastonbury High School. We had the best reunion. It was so much fun. And we said, remember growing up without screens, where we really yeah. could develop friendships. I had seven kids who were in my kindergarten class were at this reunion, okay? Wow. <laughs> and we, we were all feeling very blessed. They grew, we grew up without, without phones, iPhones. Yeah. without ever, talking through the phone. Or we actually had real friendships, real conversation. I think that gets harder. But on Christmas Eve and in this period of time, I, I find that there's, so much, there's a lot of hope. And so that, that kind of takes away from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and right. I, really, I, I say to my kids, if someone say, makes fun of you for being a Christian, Tell them, I understand your view, and I'm going to pray for you, because that's what we're called to that's do. That's what Ainsley did. Good job. Right, but you know what? You pray for yeah. people who... I told something... him, I said, I feel like the church has failed you. Like, right. I love to go to church. I wish you right. felt the same way. Yeah. Come and, with me to church. And they've been, Come. and a lot of folks have been hurt by someone mm -hmm. or something. And like, I always say, who hurt you? And, and darn for them having, right. to, having done that to you. Right. Uh, I don't want to sound too yeah. maudlin about it, but 
I love this time of year. Me I think it's a great, it's a, and it's so great to see you guys. Well, it's right. always. All right, Laura, thanks good luck today. Oh, yeah. thanks. Don't tell us everything that happens. I will. I'll text we'll be you right watching. Afterwards. You're I'll, gonna... I'll be on my screen. Right. Yeah. Right yeah. Right we'll be watching right. when you get on the elevator. All right. Brian, All right. especially. Take care. The media are still having some trouble adjusting to Donald Trump as the next president. We certainly saw this in the freak out over his phone call with the president of Taiwan and all of the implications and everyone acted like uh, he um, didn't know anything about foreign policy when in fact the Washington Post reports the call had been planned for weeks with his aides. But it's particularly true of liberal journalists, liberal commentators, liberal pundits who did not expect Donald Trump to win uh, this election and uh, you know can't stand the guy not to put too fine a point on it. But I'm starting to see some effort, some evolution uh, in trying to cope with the new reality, which is going to be uh, obviously uh, the reality here in Washington for the next four years. Particularly, there was a piece in the New Republic which talked about the dangers of outrage porn against Donald Trump. Now, there's a catchy phrase. And the idea of this piece is that the, the writer has no use for Trump, thinks he's a danger uh, to America and all of that, but says, we as liberals, he says, uh, cannot get completely and totally bonkers over every single little thing that Trump does. Otherwise, we're shouting into an echo chamber. So, for example, if Trump gets into a Twitter spat against Alec Baldwin for his unfunny and sad portrayal on Saturday Night Live, you know, fine, that doesn't have to be a big story. Um, the left doesn't have to go crazy over it. Uh, the argument here in the New Republic is that there should be more focus and more outrage and more opposition toward the president-elect uh, on substantive policy issues. But ironically, in the last couple of weeks, a lot of the coverage has revolved around some serious stuff. For example, uh, the deal uh, that Trump made with carrier air conditioning in Indiana saved about a thousand jobs. Now, you can argue that these jobs were saved through government tax breaks and government contracts, and that perhaps it's not a good way to do business generally with any company that is threatening to move factories to Mexico or any other country, even Sarah Palin criticized it, fine. Um, but that's the kind of debate we're now having. Same thing with the phone call with Taiwan. I mean, as Trump uh, moves from the status of somebody who's just interviewing a bunch of uh, potential cabinet members at Trump Tower, somebody who's actually sitting in the White House, you know, there'll still be all the distractions and he'll tweet things and that will be sort of uh, like candy for the media. But a lot of the debate and the coverage is going to necessarily uh, get more substantive as he deals with um, with important issues. Uh, another piece in the Huffington Post, which when Ariana ran the thing, you know, had this editor's note, Donald Trump is racist, sexist, xenophobic and a really bad guy, says uh, the reason that Hillary Clinton lost uh, and again, this writer blamed Trump for all kinds of things. Uh, but the reason Hillary Clinton lost was, in this writer's opinion, she wrote off the white working class. Now, I don't know if I completely say wrote off, but it is a fact that Hillary Clinton didn't campaign in Wisconsin, campaign in Michigan with a couple of days left. She thought she had those blue wall states locked up. But also, you know, I talked a lot during the campaign about what her overarching message was other than Donald Trump is crazy and dangerous and I'm not him. And I had a hard time figuring it out. I mean, she had policy positions on everything. For me to say she didn't have an economic message, I'm sure her people would give you 25 data points. But she didn't have a uh, message that she could boil down that would speak to people who work in factories, who work with their hands, the blue collar folks who uh, have not had a good time in this economy, even though unemployment is down, who are worried about the future. Uh, I think that Hillary Clinton was so focused, and I think the Huffington Post now recognizes, so focused on all these different groups, blacks, Latinos, women, younger voters, people who cared about climate change, people who cared about um, lots of other specific domestic policy issues that she didn't connect with or have any great sense of reaching out to uh, what we kind of lumped together under this working class label. And Donald Trump did. And given the fact that the election essentially turned in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin and Michigan, which no pundits thought uh, Hillary Clinton was going to lose, uh, that explains why Donald Trump is the next president. So I think maybe it's a healthy sign that some uh, of these um, media types on the left are coming out of denial and trying to grapple with the new reality. They don't like Donald Trump any better, but they're starting to understand uh, that he's going to be in charge. There's a reason Hillary Clinton lost this election. Uh, and maybe uh, as time goes on, they will uh, have to deal in the real world if you go through, what is it, the 12 stages of denial.
back on the road today. It's North Carolina. Thursday, it is Iowa. And Friday, it is Michigan. You say there are signs this is working. How? Yeah, well, it looks a lot like the final days of the campaign. Uh, these are the swing states that put Donald Trump over the top, but this purpose is different. Uh, he's not looking for votes. He's looking for support for his agenda. He's soon going to be president, uh, going to be starting to try to, uh, to change the tax code, pull out of, of trade deals, do things on immigration. He's looking for support going over the heads of any political establishment, going over the heads of the press. There is some sign that it's working. We have a new poll from Politico out this morning that shows huge support uh, for Donald Trump's actions in the carrier deal, uh, suggesting that we may see more things like that, him working with companies to try to keep jobs in the United States in the future. So he just sent out a tweet about the construction of the next Air Force One. 747 says it's going to cost $4 billion. That's too much money. Cancel the order. Uh, that was just out moments ago. So finish this sentence, okay? Al Gore walks into Trump Tower. <laughs> And he ends up meeting with the president-elect. I mean, Unbelievable. Yeah, who, who knows? Look, Donald Trump uh, was elected as a different kind of Republican, a Republican who is less doctrinaire than some in his party. Meeting with the former uh, vice president, a Democrat, is not a bad way to do that. Vice president-elect Mike Pence was on Fox and Friends this morning, said the two men, uh, Gore and Trump, tried to find some sort of common ground. Not likely they're going to find a whole lot. I think the thing to watch... Uh, about Trump and climate, global warming, is his picks for uh, energy uh, secretary and for head of the EPA, likely to come from uh, the conservative world of people who pretty much oppose everything Al Gore wants to do on those issues. I wonder who's